Memory Transcription Subject, Captain Sovlin, United Nations Fleet Command. Date, Standardized Human Time, January 16, 2137. The cryopods were in a separate, unmarked chamber, hidden behind a false wall in the hallway. Archivist Vake rubbed her damp nose, and her drooping ears bunched with apprehension. That farcel seemed more nervous than when the Terran soldiers busted down her door with guns, perhaps she knew that soldier predators were civilized, informed, and in control. I considered telling my companions that we should refrain from waking the captives until we had a plan to subdue them. However, the likelihood of offending my human friends deterred me from raising my concerns. Frost-lined glass covers were draped over the oval containers, revealing placid-looking predators. I squinted for any sign of battle scars, assessing each one's potential threat level would require knowledge of their killing experience. These were humans that desapientized their own kind, so how could we expect them to have the slightest concern for alien lifeforms, like Anso and myself? The Yodel looked unafraid of these primitive Terrans, probably because he was a primitive himself. He didn't understand the critical shifts in Earthlings' morals and behavior over the years. I count a few dozen humans in stasis, more than the soldiers we have here. This could turn into a stampede or a rampage easily, or they'll have to gun down their ancient civilians. Tyler waved his barrel at Vake. Wake them up. Unharmed, or so help me God, I'll kill you. Understood, the farcel breathed. They're going to freak out. No shit. You kidnapped them and put them to sleep for a hundred fucking years. We were trying to save your species. Why don't you worry about saving your own hide? Open the fucking pods, now. UN forces, I want every person to take a pod. Reassure these poor souls, be clear and concise explaining what's going on, and get them back to our ship. The Farsal Archivist tapped away at a central control console, eyes glimmering with worry. Carlos and Samantha heeded Tyler's orders, and each found a spot next to a pod. Anso bounced up to a container of his own, inspecting it from every angle with blind enthusiasm. I stood frozen, nervous to be within grappling change of an awoken beast. The yodel noticed my failure to follow the orders, and gestured with his tail to an unguarded pod. Maybe I should sit this one out, I offered. I'm an alien. That might agitate them, and I don't really know how to handle humans, uh. Samantha curled her lip. Get your ass over there. The least you could do is pretend to care about us, Sovlin. I do care about you. But I also know how humans from this time period conducted themselves. Is there a problem? Tyler swiveled around, and exasperation flashed in his icy eyes. We're the same species now as we were then. I don't expect people I serve alongside to see us as mindless predators. Yes, sir. Of course you're not, I'm just thinking of the Federation's dossier of your wars. I reviewed it with Resell when Marcel, forgive me. I'm going. I ducked my head in sheepish fashion and scurried within a capsule's proximity against my will. My heart rate ratcheted up, peering down at the snoozing predator. His arms were connected to wires and folded across his unmoving chest. This Terran seemed young, with unblemished skin that was more pale than Tyler's, his mane was a brown fringe that swept past his eyebrows. At least I hadn't gotten a particularly imposing specimen, but a gojit wasn't cut out to interact with these creatures. The fog on the glass cleared up, and offered an unrestricted look at the predator's face. The color began to return to the ancient human skin, and his bluish lips morphed back to a healthy pink. Vake continued pressing buttons, and stepped away as every pod's lid unsealed. I resisted the itch to draw my weapon, Tyler wouldn't appreciate me holding this primitive at gunpoint. It was important to remember that these weren't the presentable Terrans I had come to love. These were lawless hunters who lived in a harsh society, with few amenities and no knowledge of alien life. The brown-haired human's chest showed signs of movement, which gradually gained stability. 
His eyelids twitched, and his nostrils flared. I took an instinctive step backward, uncertain whether he'd try to strangle me. My remaining spines were at full bristle, the sick feeling almost mirrored my first encounter with Marcel. The predator's binocular eyes snapped open, a startling amber hue, and panic flashed in them. He snapped upright in an uncanny motion. I barely muffled my scream, every impulse in my brain wanted to plead for mercy. His pupils were trained on me, and he seemed equally frightened by my presence. My fear subsided to some degree, as the human shrank away from me. His breathing became panicked, and his hands wrapped around himself in a self-soothing gesture. The predator pressed against the back of the pod, hugging his legs to his chest. Oh God! The Terran's unusual eyes welled with tears, and his tone was rich with hyperventilation. Other waking specimens were showing signs of panic attacks, or blindly bursting from their pods. Oh God! What the fuck? Clear and concise. Tell him what's going on, and pray this is a sapient that's capable of reasoning. Easy. My words caused his brow to furrow, and he cradled his skull in his hands. That must be his first time acquiring meaning from the translator implant, which the farcel must have installed after his capture. I'm here to rescue you. My name is Sovlin, do you have a name? Hunter. Oh protector. His name is literally, Hunter, these are primitive, predator-exalting humans. But he sounds scared of me, which is odd. Where am I? What the fuck are you? You were kidnapped by aliens, er, not me or my kind. There's two precursor races who meddled with lots of primitive cultures, yours, mine. My entire planet got glassed, uh, not that you asked, but I joined up with humans after that. You see all the human soldiers around here? I work for Earth. Kidnapped by aliens? I remember camping, and a rustling noise, something sharp hit my neck and, why? What did they do? How can you work for Earth? Take me home. Hunter was growing hysterical, and his hands were shaking. I listened to his sniffling, feeling pity begin to replace my fear. However dangerous this captive might be, it was clear his narrow-minded brain was overwhelmed, the questions he posed were understandable, in light of waking up in a strange place. Hesitantly, I inched toward him, and he tensed up like I was going to hurt him. Why would an apex predator see me as dangerous? The news I was about to break might shatter his world, everything and everyone he knew was long gone. Perhaps showing empathy would convince him not to stampede or show aggression? Hunter deserved some amount of comfort, after what he'd been through. I placed a paw on the shudderingly named human's shoulder, and brought him into a cautious embrace. He wailed incoherently, sobbing into my fur. His mane and his pink and white claws were pristine even up close, to my amazement. Shockingly non-violent. How can an ancient human, who has no idea what's going on, be acting like the benevolent souls today. Maybe the historical ones weren't as barbaric as I thought. It's okay. We're going to take you home, now. You're doing great, I soothed. Hunter drew a mucus-addled breath. You're, an alien. Why can I understand you? The bastards who captured you injected a translator, I think. Listen. What I'm about to tell you is upsetting, but it's the truth. I don't know how I can help, given the circumstances, all I can promise, I'll do whatever I can. Do you really want to know what happened? The unfrozen human nodded. Please. Aliens called the Farcel captured you, and have been keeping you frozen for future experiments. They've been waking up small batches of captives for centuries, so, um, Earth isn't the Earth you remember. The solar year is 2137. Humans are an interstellar species, at war with the farcel Colchian conspiracy, because they meddled with your world and everyone else's. We located this base, and we're here to rescue you and expose the culprits. Does that make sense so far? Yes, and and no. Why would anyone want to experiment on us, on me? Has it really been, 
my family is dead, if it's been centuries. Oh God, this isn't happening. I know this is a lot, Hunter. I really wish he had a different name. Do not say, Predator, Sovlin, you don't want Hunter thinking about hunting. Much of the galaxy perceives humans as evil and violent. These guys tried to genetically cure you, like they did to my race centuries ago. After that failed, they joined the crowd that wants you extinct. They think we're evil because of the wars. And because you're a predator race, unso yipped, unsolicited. Oh, damn you, uplift. Now you've done it. Hunter's head snapped over to the yodel. The marsupial had gotten his own human out of her pod, and from the bits I overheard, he'd been hypothesizing over its engineering to her. My primitive Terran groaned, spotting the reddish-furred alien, his amber gaze darted around the room. I could sense that the primate wanted little more than to curl up under a rock and disappear, which meant he wasn't intending to harm me. However, I was worried predator talk would push him toward his name's origin. Predator race, the brown-haired beast echoed. I heaved a weary sigh. You, hunt, hunter. Your eyes face forward. The galaxy's only other predator race eats and enslaves people. That's, fucking disgusting. I'm glad, yet a little surprised, he feels that averse to the Arxer. Do they eat humans? No. Do they eat, your kind? Gojids? Yeah, um, back when I was a starship captain, they, no, wait, you didn't ask about my personal life. I apologize for my indiscretion. Go on, if you want to. I can hear the pain in your voice. Well, I was on a video call, which is a remote communication where you can see each other, with my family from my starship. They were eaten alive as I watched, and I couldn't lift a claw to help. You can say I've had to work through some fears and hatred to get used to humans. Hunter's face contorted with what I'd come to recognize as the Terran expression of sympathy. My spines began to settle down, and I decided that he didn't constitute a threat. It was surprising how little his behavior aligned with the savage cruelty, or at best, indifference, I expected from pre-FTL humanity. So much for what my therapist said about them being a territorial, aggressive species. Their dark past was almost worsened by how similar these primitives seemed to modern earthlings. I thought humans had changed, and that they attained a higher degree of empathy as civilization advanced. Yet this poorly named predator still pities me, even as his reality is in shambles. I'm so sorry, he growled. That must still weigh on you. I can't even process my family being, gone, in what was an instant for me. I think it's going to hit me like a freight train later. I cleared my throat. I'm sorry for what happened to you too. We have to make the best of our circumstances now, and maybe, along the way, get a bit of revenge. Revenge. Man, I'm just a college student, does my university still exist anymore? They all must have assumed I was dead. I bet it killed Ma. Air, depends on the city, I imagine. Long story there that involves the war. Anyhow, if you wanted, the United Nations might be able to locate some relatives. You could still have people, and maybe there's records of what happened with any loved ones you remember. Why bother? The descendants are gonna be my great-great-great something or another. My family, the one I know and care about, is long dead. It's closure. Sure, it's mainly a chance to know your future kin, and protect your family lineage. But it's also a chance to preserve your loved one's memory. That's part of why I persist, delaying a world where nobody remembers my little girl. And I tell myself there's a non-zero chance I'll feel happiness again, someday. You're much younger than me. It won't be easy, but you can make a life for yourself. As if. I'll be a shoe on the wrong foot. Won't know anything about the culture, and my qualifications probably don't mean shit anymore. What can I possibly do with myself? What is there for me on earth? I don't know how curious humans were back in your times, 
but you could start by learning about all the alien lifeforms and customs. It's a chance to discover something new, that nobody else from your era ever saw. To pass on your slice of history to the galaxy. But how do I do that? I don't think I can handle this shit. I'm no use to anyone. That's not true. The United Nations is short on manpower, so all extra hands ease the burden, no matter what capacity you're in. Start with small steps, Hunter. You don't have to have all the answers today. Small steps. Yeah, okay. Do you have something in mind? I need to keep my brain occupied. Well, why don't you come with us? We're going to sweep the archives. You can help me out just by tagging along. I would like to know how these farcel fuckers changed the history of Gojitkind, but it also scares me a little. Why? I'm worried it'll be as disturbed as your history. Or what was the present, for you? Fair, honestly. Okay then. I'll follow you, Sovlin. Most of the awakened humans were being taken back to the submarine, to be tended to in relative safety. I could hear chatter over the radio, as other groups of UN soldiers landed to aid a full sweep of the archives. The Terran military was also launching a communications buoy, to ensure that UN command above Talsk received news of this debacle. If Hunter requested to accompany us, I didn't see why Tyler would object to it. This living relic of the past could be the best chance I had to understand the nature of predators. Maybe human nature is to toe the line between great beneficence and unfathomable depravity. The choice is theirs, yet unwritten in history, with far-reaching implications for all life. Anso perked his ears up. I'm going with the group back to the ship, old man. Then, if I can choose my assignment, we're finding the yodel room. It'll be wonderful to cleanse the Federation's influence from our culture, for good. Okay. I hope you find what you need on that, but I won't be joining you. Assuming Tyler gives us the go-ahead, Hunter and I are looking into the Gojit's past, I muttered. We're coming with you. Samantha had materialized behind me, a steely look in her forest green eyes. The bio-warfare mask made her appear like a machine. Carlos and I have gone through hell with you. We're not going to let you decide you're a monster. Your therapist has enough of a headache with you already. Hunter pointed to her mask. That's a, do I need one of those? Yeah, we'll fetch you one. You should be good for now. It doesn't sound like they inject the cure until they launch a, a new batch, Carlos chimed in. Before proceeding deeper into the archives, and prying beyond the scope of actions conducted against Earth, I needed authorization for my plan for my superior. Tyler could be asked to provide Hunter with proper gear, knowing the blonde officer, he would permit the ancient Terran to tag along with me. Seeing all of humanity, past and present, as more than predators was exactly what he had asked. With the identity of every Federation species in the balance, it was our moral duty to unearth all of the Farsal's crimes against sapience. Memory Transcription Subject, Captain Sovlin, United Nations Fleet Command. Date, Standardized Human Time, January 16, 2137. With multiple crews having touched down at the Galactic Archives, we split up into teams. Tyler presented us with one hour to accrue the most essential data, and reconvene at the submarine to transport the intel elsewhere. In case anything went wrong, getting any information about key species off-world was critical. Venlil, Zerulians, Arxer, Yodel, and Crocodile were considered the top five, thankfully, my commander also honored my personal request to investigate the Gojids. Officer Cardona decided to accompany Anso to the Yodel room, while also keeping watch over farcel prisoners such as Vake. Carlos wound up leading our small posse, roping a timid archivist into showing us the way. Hunter had acquired suitable attire from the submarine, and loped after us. If someone told me a day ago that I'd turn my back on a primitive predator, with a name that fit how I imagined their nomenclature, I would have laughed. However, my concerns about the ancient Terran had all but evaporated. 
I have bigger issues on my plate, with what I'm about to seek out. This could destroy the little that's left of my heritage. To say I was terrified of the Gojit's true history was an understatement. Depending on the degree of atrocities I uncovered, what was best for my species might be to bury it once and for all. Certain unsavory elements shouldn't come back, no matter how egregious the Federation's removal methods were. How would the rest of the galaxy perceive us, and our refugees, if we were at all similar to the Terrans' past? Shadows moved behind me, and I felt slight pressure on my spine. A yelp came from Hunter, who nursed his now bleeding pointer finger, the primitive human had decided, without warning, to poke the end of a bristle. He brought it upon himself, touching a sharp object for no reason. Maybe Anso wasn't so bad, compared to other creatures below a certain technological level. What compelled you to do that? I spat. Hunter shrugged. Curiosity killed the cat. Only one way to find out how sharp it really is, you know? Say, why do you just have spikes on part of your back? It's like there are blotches without it. Well, let's say they got lined up by a machine gun, and were ripped out of my spine by a stream of bullets. It hurt, it really hurt. They can't regrow either because I'm fucking old, so Sam calls me baldy to rub it in my face. Does that answer your question? Ouch. Yeah, man. Carlos risked a curious glance back. What year was it for you? You sound like you're from the States. 1966, American, born and raised. I used to wonder why aliens would target you crazy Yanks, in all the UFO tales, Sam quipped. Maybe they were drawn to you because of your media presence. Figured you represented us all, you act like you do, Australian accent? That it is. Now's your chance for the kangaroo jokes. Never heard those before. Actually, I wanted to ask about the glass rectangles you all have on your belts. Are those 22nd century TVs? I barely kept my disdain to myself, instead focusing on Carlos. The male guard was holding a farcel prisoner at gunpoint, we'd entered a new hallway in search of the gojid room. Again, I remarked internally how Anso was versed enough in technology to regurgitate a textbook, at least. He never questioned what basic things were, or showed such an obvious lack of knowledge. Hunter clearly knew very little about any technology. No, people still like their television sets large and mounted. Samantha unclipped her holopad, unlocking it with facial ID. This is a holopad, it actually can facilitate watching TV shows, though. Mostly, it's used to access the internet and talk instantaneously with friends. You had phones in your time, right? Hunter huffed in indignation. Phones existed since the 1800s. You're telling me, that little thing, can call people? With video streams, or send them written messages. The screens being 3D are a nice touch. Okay. Streams like a river, is the video water powered? And, uh, what's the internet? Does he even know what a computer is? That's going to be difficult to explain. I attempted to withhold a derisive tone. Streams are a live video feed. Does the word, computer, mean anything to you? We should start there. Yes, but that can't be a proper computer. They take up entire rooms. Your, holopad, could fit in a pocket. There's no way that could have the necessary power, and you're not even chilling the mechanisms. Hunter exclaimed. We can pack enormous processing power into tiny chips, and perform functions more complex than you can imagine, Carlos explained. The internet is a way that computers communicate, all the way across the globe, and now, the galaxy. It's basically a web for housing forums and information, and by now, it encompasses the collective knowledge of mankind. Samantha hummed in appreciation. It is remarkable, really. You can ask a question, and a program scours that entire archive. Millions of results on any topic you can dream of, science, history, 
celebrities, entertainment, at your fingertips in seconds. Wow! I can't even understand how humans could build something like that. Research must be so easy for you. We had to scour books to find a single source, and you have millions of encyclopedias thrown into your lap. You have no idea how good you have it, do you? Humans have come a long way from being primitive, I acknowledge. Carlos curled his fist and started to round on me, that was before noticing that the farcel had finished guiding us to the gojid chamber. My spines bristled, sensing a grave threat in the information housed here. Grappling with the undisguised truth of our omnivory, and possibly seeing my own kind feast on flesh, I wasn't ready for concrete evidence. The knowledge of my ancestry had almost sapped my will to live the first time, even with my unpaid debt to earth. I felt disgusting, just dwelling on the loathsome facts. My human companions weren't as hesitant as me, skulking into the room. They barked orders, using their guns as motivators, gojids were mixed in with the native staff, and part of me wondered if these were from the cradle's primitive era. However, the fact that some called out, United Nations, suggested they were active conspirators, not captives. I tailed my comrades, sweeping my gun around the room for any threats. Hunter tiptoed after me, apprehensive about our locale. Samantha took the privilege of coercing the staff to lie on the ground. Flexing a tattooed arm in menacing fashion, Carlos ordered the farcel archivist who guided us here to unlock the mainframe. The conspiracy employee trudged forward and leaned over a sensor for a retinal scan. Too soon for my liking, we had access to the grand collection, everything documented at Gojidkind was at my claws. Hunter fell in by my side, and arched a quizzical eyebrow. He didn't understand why I was keeping away from the console, like it burned to the touch. Tyler said we have one hour to gather intel, but take your time, Sam hissed. I drew a deep breath, and hovered my claw over a series of folders. Carlos procured a drive, starting to download any files he could find. Should I have prevented the human from transcribing this info, at least until I reviewed the contents myself? Nerves hindered my breathing, as conscious thoughts diminished. My mind was in a trance, but I managed to pull up a piece labeled Overview, on screen. Welcome, Archivists of the Future, and congratulations on your promotions. A farcel voiceover thundered over the video feed, and I flinched at the volume. This video will be a brief synopsis of species 92A, who go by the name Gojid. Millions of hours of pre-contact footage are available, to be sorted over the years by your diligent pause. I've compiled examples of the key aspects of their culture, and a conclusive analysis of their successful conversion. Hunter tilted his head, watching footage of prehistoric Gojids rigging a sailboat. The video scrolled through a series of clay houses, and sprawling orchards that didn't look much different from the modern day. An overhead image of a village, with limited electric lights, completed the narrative. It slowly faded to black, void of narration, and switched to primitive cave artwork of workers tilling fields. The Gojids call their homeworld the Cradle, a name that stems from a local deity, the Great Protector. As their creation myth goes, all of nature was crafted to be the perfect home for their species, the farcel declared on the recording. The land provides, and she heeds their cries against threats by famine or beast. This has been their predominant religion since the advent of agriculture. Farming doctrine and the faith were spread alongside each other, with the locals claiming the protector taught them how plants grew. Surveillance video showed gojids sorting through a forest, and gathering up anything they could find. The camera lens zeroed in on half-eaten carcasses, which were thrown onto a cart by the primitives. These filthy members of my kind stopped short of a clearing, ducking into bushes. Splotchy, lean predators with massive fangs were stalking a grazing species, and downing as many of the prey as they could. The gojids are hiding because they saw the predators. That's prey behavior, right? A gunshot rang out, and the gojids burst from the foliage with reckless abandon. One splotchy predator snarled in pain, as a bullet bore into its haunches. The primitive sapients were stretching their arms out to appear larger, 
and waving their claws around. To my bewilderment, the hunting animals dashed off without their prey, my people drove predators away from a catch, with aggression. The Gojids congratulated themselves, before collecting the kills. The recording proceeded with an explanation. Gojids are a scavenger species. They allow predators to do the dirty work, then swoop in to obtain the carcasses. Flesh is not a staple of their diet, but rather a pricey treat for occasional consumption. What you just witnessed is a family of market vendors, scrounging for cuts to sell to the upper class. With this being an accepted cultural item, one of status even, it's apparent to us that a cure is needed. The government, locally elected settlement councils, even send out foraging parties during times of hardship, it's endorsed as a method of survival by their very leaders. The footage transitioned to grainy images of starships landing, and stories plastered in prehistoric newspapers. Creatures from another world, they come bearing gifts, the headline read. The front page image showed a priest of the Great Protector in conversation with a Kolshan. I managed to read a bit about a new future for Gojitkind, before the feed cut to pro exterminator pamphlets. My emotions were in turmoil, after seeing my kind scooping up predator food on film. Could I argue that the farcel's gift of the cure wasn't a blessing? Was it that wrong to initiate a proper belief system? Their temperament toward aliens proved non-hostile. Formal re-education seemed too extreme. With how invested Gojids were in nature, convincing them to adopt exterminators, they weren't amenable to the concept. They laughed off our teachings, and spurned our ways. Conversion would go on to require decades of gradual effort. Had the Gojids been introduced to the wider galaxy in a hurry, it would have been disastrous. But with the technology we gave them, how could they not come to love us? That was how we got our paws in the door, and it also let us slip our ideas into the public domain. We mixed the cure with life-saving medicines, and spread the rumor that it was a judgment from the protector. Clips of Farsal transporting our priests to remote wilderness, and beginning excavations, played on the main screen. The time-lapse showed days of work, condensed into a span of minutes. Hunter and Samantha both were enamored with the landscape, between the jagged fronds on the trees and the sunset orange sands. I was more focused on the tablets the archaeologists were digging up, and passing to Gojit observers for examination. Those were the protector's stones, they were preserved in our planetary museum, and cited as its oldest texts. Of course, the priesthood insisted that all of nature was created by their deity for a higher purpose. But after discovering the texts we planted, they did our work for us. Predators were cursed by bloodlust, tarnishing the protector's creation, they existed to threaten and kill. Her words. Gojids, the chosen, would be punished if they continued down the predator path, why else would they suddenly be dying from meat consumption? Within decades, we'd wiped all recollection of their scavenger past. I had already grown accustomed to the idea that our religion was falsified by the Federation. Fortunately, I'd never been an adherent of the faith, so it didn't affect me. What was alarming was how easy it had been for them to convince our entire planet those tablets were legitimate findings. History could be rewritten at their whims, and nobody would remember that it had once been different. Was this distortion of our primary faith necessary? All things considered, the summative montage hadn't been as horrific as I imagined, with a single incident captured of carcass collection, perhaps I could pass it off as a single tribe, and clear our name. The final pieces of the video were of Gojids at Federation summits, and patrolling on starships. I reminded myself that these clips were from before the Arxer's discovery, to our knowledge. The military fixtures on the bridge seemed odd, and left me wondering if our aggression was that severe as to build war vessels. Why would we need a military? For the exterminators to clear colonies, or for violent purposes? The Gojids had become model federation members, they completed a slow, but smooth transition. Their malleability allowed us to fine-tune their temperament. We worked to elicit fleeing responses to predatory stimuli, of course. 
but their natural ability to tackle threats and protect their fields from harm made them the ideal military species, in a defensive capacity. I paused the video. What? They chose for us to become a powerful species, despite being omnivores? I knew they used the crocodile, but were not that aggressive. They co-opted your religion, poisoned you through doctors, and that's what you focus on? Hunter grumbled. I don't understand any of what I woke up to, but my head hurts. Samantha wagged a finger. What's with the chit-chat? Finish the video, so we can pack it up. There's only a few seconds left in this prick's monologue, thank heavens. I played the farcel's end note, at the human's request. Due to the Gojid's location, it's in the Federation's interest to encourage their military growth. They could act as a safeguard, to keep species 45G in line, should those nightmares ever find their roots. Having a compliant asset mitigates risk of such aggression spilling over our borders unchecked. Thus, I'm grateful they're stuck being 45 GS neighbors. I expect Gojids to necessitate little correction, and to fulfill a stabilizing role, perhaps even pacifying the region. Carlos and Samantha looked mystified by the mention of Species 45G. I was befuddled too, until I pondered the short list of Gojid neighbors. The Venlo were the weakest race in the galaxy, so it was obviously not them, the Zerulian specialized in healing, which wasn't an aggressive practice. The Doser couldn't attack a cotton ball with their size. That led to the apparent answer, the Farsal must have discovered humanity before Hunter's time, before they'd even discovered the Gojids. Why wasn't that documented in the Terran chamber? Why hadn't Cure Research begun sooner? That's certainly interesting. Samantha, having not stumbled upon the only possible answer, waved her gun in the Farsal prisoners' faces. Who is Species 45G? Are they dead? Sorry, but I can't tell you, a staffer croaked. I chewed at my claws. Is it humans? No. That video is from before the Arxer were discovered, let alone the Terrans. Use some modicum of logic. Give us a straight answer, right now. We don't have time for your games. Who is it? Samantha roared. We'll find out eventually, with or without you in one piece. Carlos raised a placating hand. It can't be worse than what you've done to humans. A little late to start hiding things, don't you think? Just give us a name to put with this 45G designation. Without our history haunting me, I could focus on helping the United Nations pick apart other findings. I checked the progress of the human's data download, which showed as almost complete. Perhaps the last note could be used to make the Gojids respectable again. This mystery species must be one the Federation wiped out, which suggested Earth wasn't the first planet they were willing to genocide. It seemed likely nobody had heard of 45G, so we'd have to locate their extinct homeworld. Pushing the focus onto the truly dangerous species might be good. It offers an unknown threat, and the farcel complemented our civility by comparison. The female predator bared her teeth. Why aren't you talking? Name. Spit it out. Why don't you ask about something else? The farcel staffer gulped, as Samantha fired a bullet right next to his ear. The Venlil. It's the Venlil. Shock made my blood run cold, and the humans displayed equal surprise. Hunter showed no signs of disbelief, but he wasn't familiar with the Venlil's reputation. The farcel must be fibbing with his answer, though it was bold to provide an obvious false response at gunpoint. Perhaps it was worth it to investigate what other Terran soldiers found in their greatest allies' archive chamber.